So you decided you want to play Arcanist. Well, let's see if we can help you figure out what master you want to play. What's up everybody, Jeff here, and a while back I did a video about how to choose your faction for Malifaux, based mostly on the lore and the look and feel of the factions. I think the best way to make those decisions is based on the rule of cool. So if you think you like Arcanist, but you're not sure what master you like the best, then you've come to the right place. What we're going to do here is we're going to go through each master as well as their crew, talk a little bit about their background, the look and feel, and show off some of the pretty models. That way you can get a little better sense for what might appeal to you. And just to be thorough, my buddies over at the Danger Planet are going to help out and give us a little bit of background about how the Masters also play. So huge shout out to those guys. Thanks a lot for the help. Now make sure you stay tuned because if you're actually interested in any other factions, which you shouldn't be because Arcanists are the good guys, then we'll have videos like this coming out for all of them in the future. So make sure you subscribe to the channel and like the video so that more people can see this. While you're here, if you want to support the channel, we have a merch store linked in the description, as well as a weird affiliate link if you're going to make some purchases and you want to help us out. And then of course there's the Patreon where you can support the channel directly and you can actually get a whole bunch of different cool kickbacks like ad-free versions of the videos. And with that, let's get into the Arcanists. Anna Solicaris grew up as an orphan on Earth. She was eventually taken in by a woman who had connections with the guild, but the woman was a cruel mother. Karis soon found out that she was only there to help the woman take the lives of different people in order to recharge soul stones for profit. She eventually learned that she was part of this experiment too, to try to test a theory of whether a child who was full of hope would charge a soul stone better than the average person. Learning that it was all a lie, Karis turned on her adoptive mother, taking a pair of metal wings that the woman kept in her closet and making her escape. She worked as a mercenary and a troubleshooter for various organizations before Victor Ramos, leader of the Miners and Steamfitters Union, convinced her to come to Malifaux. She agreed to work for him exclusively in exchange for his tutelage in helping her learn to harness magic. She struggled for a while, frustrated at her inability to exert her control, until she finally learned how to let go and embrace the chaos. When Ramos took his leave, he left Karis in charge of the Arcanists and Tony Ironsides in charge of the Union. Always fiery-tempered, Karis spent her time carrying out raids and attacks against the Guild, until Ironsides betrayed Ramos and he was arrested. This infuriated Karis, who saw Ramos as her mentor, and soon she went to confront Ironsides directly. The two fought it out and then came to a tense truce, but not long after, the Burning Man showed up. This mystical entity attracts people in a cult-like following, and soon it had exerted its influence over Karis. So why might you be interested in Karis and the Wildfire crew? Well, Karis herself is a fire witch with metal wings, which is pretty cool in and of itself. She tends to be pretty angry and aggressive, and if you like the type of people who handle their problems with direct action, even if it might result in some collateral damage, then she might be your type of person. The crew is comprised of a bunch of fire monsters, which are really striking models on the table, as well as a couple of pyromaniacs and some followers of the Cult of the Burning Man. So you get a pretty good variety of model types, and this crew could be a really good way to practice painting fire effects. And with that, let's see what Doug from the Danger Planet has to say about how Karis and the Wildfire crew play on the tabletop. So Karis 1 is what I would refer to as kind of an all-around master. She's really good because she does a lot of basic things really well. First of all, she's got run and gun, which then means that every one of her charge actions can generate a shot action, but she also flies. So she can blip all over the place with a really, really strong movement plus shot action. And then she has one of the best melee attacks in the game, in Up We Go, which has a two-inch reach to it, and it basically can displace models off of objective points or put friendly models onto objective points. It's not really that good at fighting, but it's really good at positioning. And then other than that, she plays around with uh, scheme pyre marker manipulation, where she makes these 50 millimeter discs of hazardous burning terrain, and then she can shoot them over the map and stuff with fan the flames. She gets a lot of value for her actions, She's got a really good punch, she's got a really good shoot, and she's got a really good fast action. So she's just a very solid, generic, all-round master, basically. I wouldn't say she does anything particularly exceptionally, but I wouldn't say she does anything badly either. Uh, another big thing, when we talked about those hazardous effects, you can't ignore them if she's the leader, which is a big deal because there are a lot of models that can ignore hazardous terrain uh, or ignore like burning effects. So Now, Karis 2 is a whole different scenario. Karis 2 is a pinball machine of death. Basically, you are eschewing the balanced, reasonable nature of Karis 1, and what you're taking on is this thing that can stack all of these burning conditions and then pinball around the map, and at the end of the turn, nuke an individual model with a ton of burning. And basically what she does is she doesn't take burning herself, but she can absorb it like Jean Grey, the phoenix from X-Men, and then she just flies off and then just 
drops it all onto an enemy model at the end step, and that model explodes into gibbets. So that's basically what Keras 2 is doing. Very different play style than Keras 1. I would suggest if you're going to get a Keras crew, maybe get a couple of games under your belt with Keras 1, but then definitely check out Keras 2 because it is a hoot of a time. Tony Ironsides is the daughter of escaped slaves in the United States. As a girl, she witnessed her father being lynched on trumped-up charges, and the experience had a profound impact on her view of the world. She began participating in underground fighting rings as a way to vent her anger, but also had a lifelong love of learning. And when she was recruited into the Arcanist and came to Malifaux, she developed a close relationship with the mages due to their shared love of reading and scholarship. At first, she simply worked as an enforcer, acting against outside threats. But due to her close ties with the mages, Ramos soon had her specializing in taking care of Arcanist members who go rogue. She had a natural ability to rally the workers, so when Ramos took his leave, he left Ironsides in charge of the Union. But Tony had been questioning Ramos's dedication to the movement, and when the new Governor General stepped in and offered her a deal, offering to pressure the United States to pass universal suffrage in exchange for giving up Ramos, Ironsides couldn't say no. She felt some guilt over the decision, but was convinced that the price was worth paying, but not everyone saw it this way. Karis, the leader of the much more militant end of the Arcanists, soon confronted her, and the two came to blows, though Ironside's expertise in one-on-one -on -one combat meant that Karis wasn't much of a match. The two women came to a tense truce, after Ironside's convinced her that Ramos wasn't looking out for the Arcanists anymore, and that they needed to be unified to face the guild. As leader of the Union, Ironside spends much of her time doing paperwork and administration, work that she actually hates, as she would much rather be out getting her hands dirty. So why would you want to play Tony Ironsides and her crew? Well, Tony happens to be one of my favorite masters in the game. She has an interesting and kind of tragic backstory, but she's one of the few people in the lore who seems to actually be a really good person. But she's also willing to make some sacrifices to get what she wants. And I really like the dynamic where she's this really badass fist fighter, but she's also a bookworm and kind of a nerd. It's also pretty cool because there's not many miniatures games where you can play as a union with a bunch of laborers and lawyers and average people on your side. They may not be the most striking crew in the game, but some of the models are really cool anyway. And it can be really cool to have a picket line going up against a team of monsters. And now let's hear from Doug again about how Ironsides and the MNSU play in the game. The next master here is Tony Ironsides. And I would be remiss if not to mention this is a close personal favorite of Mr. Dice. So uh, I hope I do this one justice, Mr. Dice. So Tony is all about bubbling up. Tony's crew creates a really, 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 really powerful defensive bubble that they layer on top of one another with buffs. She's got a really good action that is pretty central to her card called Bring It, which can basically move a model into her bubble where she can then beat them up with the protection of all of her crew. That's effectively what Tony is doing. Now, Tony 2, Union President, is way different. Tony 2, Union President, is kind of more similar to the original Colette in the performer keyword. She's very schemey. Uh, she's all about onboard movement and manipulation of scheme markers and producing value through smaller minions that can then protect your scheme markers. She's really good at scoring objectives and points, but she loses a lot of that punchiness and a lot of that damaginess where she can like take a model, pull it into her bubble and beat it to death. Tony Union President is not doing that. Tony Union President basically can manipulate scheme markers and summon uh, smaller minions that help protect and move around scheme markers, basically. Colette Dubois started off as a pickpocket and street magician, using her beautiful appearance to take advantage of unsuspecting men. When she passed through the breach, her skills were soon augmented with the use of real magic, and she gathered a group of followers who put on shows together. She worked her way up, and eventually became the owner of the Star Theater, one of the most famous monuments in all of Malifaux. At night, they put on fabulous burlesque shows that cater to Malifaux's elite and the guild themselves. But after hours, they get up to something different. In the basement of the Star is an entrance to the sewers, underground tunnels that span the city, and that Colette uses to spearhead the smuggling operation for the Arcanists. Moving all manner of illicit goods to and from the breach, Colette's position in the Arcanists is very important, but it also puts her girls in danger. As a result, when Ramos was arrested, Colette was not very upset, as she now had the freedom to do only what she wanted. With Karis in control of the Arcanists, she decided to take some of the burden off of Colette, freeing her up to focus on her shows and allowing the Star Theater to flourish. Being a very high-profile and famous member of the Arcanists puts Colette in particular risk, especially considering that she's smuggling right under the guild's nose in downtown Malifaux. So what would make someone interested in Colette's crew? Well, a stage performer and a bunch of showgirls is certainly unique as far as war games are concerned. So if you want to play something very different and very interesting, this is probably a great crew for you. Colette and most of her showgirls are all dressed up in fancy outfits, looking like members of high society. And even the few men in the crew tend to be dressed up. 
or doing some sort of display of pyrotechnics. Some of the more interesting models in the crew, though, are the constructs that Colette works with. The mannequins can follow the showgirls around and help them out, and Colette has her mechanical doves. But the Corophy are the real stars of the show. If you think that ballerina murder robots are cool, then definitely consider picking up Colette and the performer keyword. Now let's talk to Doug for more about how Colette and the performer keyword play in game. Now, just like every master in Malifaux, there's two versions of Colette. We're going to start with the first version. Basically, the big thing here is Colette and most of her performer crew operate off of don't mind me as kind of like a keyword wide trait. Basically, that means that they can take the interact action even while they're engaged and they don't have to worry about models engaging them and locking them down. So her crew is really good at movement and steaming. Her strengths are not necessarily fighting, but if you're looking for a master that can have tons of movement flexibility, really fast models, and get really good scheming chances out there, rather than necessarily straightforward fighting, then Colette is a really good master to take a look at. Their other version is Colette Dubois, the smuggler. And she also has Don't Mind Me, which is again, very common in performer. But what you're gonna see out of Colette Dubois, the smuggler, is that she can put proxy little totems of herself all over the board and then take actions through those. And she can also copy actions and mimic things. So she's a very, very interesting master to play. I kind of see her as the next evolution of the original title in that she's very schemy. She can apply mobility to things. She has the ability to do a lot of different flexible things. I would suggest checking out the first version of Colette before you move to the second version of Colette though. But she's definitely a really cool keyword and has some of the funnest models, in my opinion, in all of Arcanists in the performer keyword. Marcus was once a respected professor in academia. His research and experiments found him heading out into nature more often, until eventually he was more comfortable there than in a library. He began working with bestial magic, learning how to twist and reshape animals, and his own body was no exception. He learned how to change his own appearance, making him look many decades younger than he actually was. He came to Malifaux to further his research on the unique and exotic species there, and soon allied with the Arcanists and the Union, though his true loyalty was to his work. While pursuing the perfection of his craft, he spent many years working inside the domain of the Fey Queen. Eventually they came into contact, and Marcus asked her for access to her secrets and magic. The two ended up fighting for dominance, and when the bout was over, they both knew that Marcus would have gotten the better of the Fey Queen if it were not for one of her servants' interference. They gained each other's respect, and Marcus walked away with access to the knowledge that he wanted. With the return of Lord Cooper, a man who defiled nature and killed animals just for sport, Marcus now has a new problem on his hands. He had tried to kill the man years before, but he's recently come back with a new body and is now dead set on hunting down Marcus and his companions. So why might somebody be interested in playing Marcus and Chimera? I think Marcus's crew is one of the coolest looking crews in the whole game. It's full of all matter of strange looking animals, and even before Marcus started mutating them and changing them, the animals that are native to Malifaux are like strange versions of animals you might be familiar with. Lions with three heads, bears with spikes, and really big poisonous snakes. The jackalope is an undying murder bunny. Oh, and don't forget, this crew has Kojo, so that's really kind of all I needed to say. And now let's go to Doug for some more info about how Marcus and the Chimera crew play in the game. So Marcus number one is really a support master. He focuses on handing out all different types of upgrades to his crews that either make them faster or harder to hit or hit harder or move quicker or scheme better. And he basically cycles through those upgrades. And so playing Marcus uh, one is very much a support master and you're trying to figure out how you can best support the key pieces of your crew with Marcus. Now, Marcus two, Alpha, is very, very different than his first one. Marcus II is, I like to call him like a, a good second master hire or an initial hire. He's basically a really mobile beat stick that has a couple of really good auras. Um, one of the strongest auras, in my opinion, in all of Malifaux is uh, the Wilds of Malifaux. It's similar to Gravity Wells, basically. It says that the area within four of this Marcus model is treated as severe terrain and models cannot be placed within four by enemy effects, which is really strong. And then on top of that, he has Leap, which is a ton of individual mobility for this piece, and he's got a bunch of pretty good attacks. So very different than the first Marcus. The first Marcus is a support master. The second Marcus is a jumping all over the place, beating people up with a really good debuff or a master, basically.
Rasputina was brought to Malifaux as a prison laborer. She somehow managed to escape from the guild's custody and made contact with the tyrant known as December. He took her as a host, granting her some of his power, as well as leadership of the cult of cannibals that follow him in the north. December sent Rasputina on a mission, where she came in contact with the Neverborn, who almost killed her. She was found by Ramos and the Arcanists, who offered her knowledge of magic and access to soul stones in exchange for her cooperation. She agreed, but still made her way to Kythera, where December wanted her to close a portal to another realm that would allow him to exert his power. Having done this, December manifested as a huge Wendigo, but was then defeated by the Victorias and their tyrant-infused blade. With December weakened, Rasputina fought to exert her power over him, trying to regain her independence while the tyrant tried to crush her. She continued to work with the Union over the years, because they gave her access to resources she needed. But the alliance was tense, and Ramos often had to come personally to keep her in line. With the return of the Fae Queen Titania, who originally defeated the tyrants, December gave Rasputina even more control, for fear that he would be found out and defeated by the Queen. Now that Ramos is gone, Rasputina is unsure what her relationship with the organization will be, and she's looking through some of Ramos' old safe houses, trying to find answers and a purpose. I think I know somebody who's really fond of Rasputina and the December keyword. Hey, Deck from Corner Case, what do you think? What's up, guys? You're in the hobby corner with me, your guest star, your winter wonder lad, and your best friend, Deck. I'm making this guest appearance to tell you what you all already know, and that's that Rasputina and December keyword are obviously the coolest in Malifaux. Now, elemental constructs are not anything unique within the realm of tabletop gaming, and especially not within the realm of, you know, like a fantasy genre. But within Malifaux specifically, I just think the December keyword, the ice golem, uh, the ice gammon, the frozen constructs, the December cult is such a cool flavor. In a world like Malifaux, where it's got that Old West flavor. There's, you know, the mines, the desert, the old town kind of vibe, the crew that just brings with them the oppressive force of Mother Nature's cruel winter is so, so cool. Every table you come to, you're bringing the blizzard. And uh, 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 of course, the models are just the coolest. From a playstyle perspective, I think it's easy to say that Rasputina has some very clear strengths and weaknesses and she has to play to them. And as a player, I really enjoy trying to be creative uh, within that tighter space. And so I have a lot of fun playing her as well. And lastly, you know, I think Rasputina, having been in the game for a long time, since the first edition, uh, she has received a lot of love from Weird and has uh, a lot of alternate, uh, uh, and has a lot of alternate sculpts and models. Um, so the collection aspect is also really fun. And obviously come every uh, a winter season, you'll be playing your December crew to be festive. If you like what you're seeing on screen and you think you might be interested in Raspy, then Defective Dice already created a lore deep dive video for Rasputina. Um, and if you wanna know more, uh, you can always ask people over on the Weird Discord or on De Defective Dice's Discord as well. Happy Folidays. Thanks so much for your input, Deck. That ice golem is really gorgeous. But with that, let's go back over to Doug for some more info about the December keyword and Rasputina and how they play on the table. So Rasputina really focuses on making markers. Now, where Karis makes markers that are these 50 millimeter discs that are burning and hazardous, Rasputina makes smaller ice, ice pyre markers. They're tall, and then she can refract her abilities through them. So she's going to shoot out and create a bunch of these ice pillars along with a bunch of the folks in her crew. Different models can do it as well. And they all will interact through these ice pillars. They can draw a line of sight for their actions through them. They can take actions as if they were the ice pillars. They can explode the ice pillars for fun and profit. All ice pillar all the time. She was a, an example of a card that was rec uh, not recently, but in the two buff cycles ago, they completely rewrote this card. So what she was at the beginning of M3, completely rewritten now, basically. Uh, still a lot of stuff around Ice Mirror, which is what I talked about. And then Glacial, Glacial Surge is a really big deal. It means that she has a lot of card trajectory and can draw cards well. Other than that, she's got a bunch of actions that are either really good shooting slow onto things or doing blasts. But that's kind of the deal with uh, Rasputina 1. Rasputina 2 is a summoner. Uh, she still plays a lot of the same games that Rasputina 1 does in that she has Ice Mirror as well. 
So that's what we talked about where you can take melee actions uh, or the model can draw a line of sight through ice pillars, uh, which is pretty cool. So I would definitely suggest checking out both of these masters. I think they're both pretty reasonable to try out. Again, you're looking at the difference between kind of like a board state control master versus what I would kind of call more of a pure summoner, but both worth checking out. The Ten Thunders are a secret criminal syndicate that operated out of China, Japan, and Vietnam. When their leader, known as the Oyabun, decided to try to infiltrate into Malifo using their secret breach in the north, he sent through many operatives, including Mei Fang. She was instructed to try to infiltrate the Miners and Steamfitters Union, an important position because they control construction of the rail lines. The Oyabun gave her the magical ability to build and command the metal golems, giant constructs that could lay down rail lines much faster and more efficiently than any human crew. Access to these metal golems gave Mei Fang the ability to work very efficiently, and she rose through the ranks of the foundry until she became its leader. She works for the Union while taking orders from the Ten Thunders, but her true loyalty lies with her workers and her people. She commands the loyalty and respect of her workers because she's well known for purchasing mechanical limbs for those who get injured, helping them to continue working to support their families, and staying out of debt. After Misaki took over the Ten Thunders, Mei Fang betrayed her, trying to take Thunder's assets and send them back Earthside to support China's fight against their guild occupiers. Misaki came to stop her, and the two came to blows, but Mei Fang explained to the Oyabun that her predecessor had been oppressing the Chinese immigrants, forcing them to work for the Ten Thunders on pain of violence. Misaki and Mei Fang came to a tense truce. Mei Fang would remain loyal, and Misaki would allow her to send some support back Earthside. So why is Mei Fang in the Foundry cool? While Mei Fang herself is both a laborer, she's sort of the leader of the Foundry crew, as well as a magic user. She's pretty good in a fist fight, but the big thing about her crew is that she has access to the Metal Golem and Metal Gaiman that she makes and controls. The rest of her crew is comprised of rail workers and other folks who help get the job done, but it even includes some gremlins who have popped up out of the bayou and taken some interest in their work. So with Mei Fang, you can actually pull models from the Ten Thunders, the Arcanists, and the bayou, which can make for a pretty unique looking crew. And now let's throw to Doug for some info about how Mei Fang and the Foundry play in the game. Mei Fang is another dual master. She's Ten Thunders and Arcanists. Mei Fang 1 is all about blip movement around the board, where she places markers and can her and her crew can do what's called ride the rails and blip to them. And then she's got like a machine gun style, like deadly iron claw attack that she can punch into people. And so she's all about really, really, really high movement flexibility and melee damage output. And then she's got a pretty good short range breath of fire attack on her as well. And she can vent seam to have concealment against uh, shooting crews. Now, Mei Fang 2 is way more of a board control value summoner who is a lot more about board state control and just hand value and summoning models onto the table and then supporting and buffing those models. She is not as high a DPS output, but she also has passive damage in heated iron. And she's also really good for allowing your models to get through things that are hazardous terrain laden, because she can help ignore that with a huge aura. So where Mei Fang 1 is mobility and damage, Mei Fang 2 is support, summoning, and value. Sandeep Desai grew up as an orphan in guild-occupied India. He spent his childhood at a local temple, studying the arcane and devouring books which allowed him to become a skilled manipulator of the elements and a powerful mage. Eventually, his peaceful life was disrupted when his temple was attacked by the guild and his master was executed. Sandeep grabbed the gada that his master had used and found that it was possessed by the spirit, Banasuva. He let Banasuva loose, and it got him a fiery revenge on the guild occupiers. After this incident, he fled to Malifo with Ramos's help in exchange for agreeing to help the next generation of Arcanist mages. He tries desperately not to allow Vanasuva to manifest himself, preferring to live in peace and go on studying with his students. When Ramos was arrested, Sandeep chose not to take sides in the conflict, preferring to meditate and keep to himself, and acting as a voice of reason for anyone who would listen. When a man named Loeth Bot from his homeland came to Malifo, seeking his help with elemental gaiman who had been haunting the man's life, Sandeep quickly agreed. When he wasn't able to help the man, they sought out Rasputina, who also has experience with gaiman, and she led them to a mysterious cave in the north. Rasputina tricked them both, and the man was sucked into the soulstone geode, and soon the cavern they were in started to collapse, and Sandeep and Rasputina had to flee. This incident made Sandeep angry, feeling tricked and betrayed by the Winter Witch, and the fate of the man is still something that Sandeep deeply regrets. So what makes Sandeep cool and interesting? Well, if you like the elemental models of the other crews, then Sandeep's probably your man because he can deal with all of them. Fire, ice, metal, and he's even got his own wind and poison gaming. So it really runs the gamut. 
He also has models that are inspired by Hindu mythology, which is pretty cool, and not something that you see in a lot of miniatures games. That's in addition to models that are pulled right from Indian history. The keyword is pretty big, so there's a lot of stuff here to collect, and it can make for a really cool painting project. And now let's go to Doug for some more info about how Sandeep and the elemental and academic keywords feel in the game. Now Sandeep 1, Sandeep Academic, is the quintessential summoner of the Arcanist. He is a summoner through and through. He has all sorts of value procs. It's notable that he has both the human side, the academics, and the magical side, the elementals. And he's a prime example of a dual keyword, not a dual faction, but a dual keyword master. And part of mastering Sandeep is understanding when and where to summon different things to complete different objectives, and also how to synergize the academics, which are the humans, with the elementals. So that's a big deal. That's something you want to uh, take a good look at and uh, make sure you're doing correctly. So then we're going to look at Sandeep 2. Sandeep 2 is not really as much of a summoner. He works with uh, putting down all different types of markers, whether or not those are scrap markers, pyre markers, ice markers, and then creating weird shockwave effects uh, that are synergistic with them. And he uses a pretty strong gun, which is from heaven and earth. Still, you've got to manage both academic and elemental. So similar scenario there. Charles Hoffman was brought to Malifaux by his brother Ryle. The two experienced a horrible accident, and Victor Ramos saved Ryle after his body had nearly been destroyed. Charles was recruited by the guild to head up their amalgamation office, the branch of the organization that enforces the law against using human parts in mechanical constructs. He was thankful to Ramos for saving his brother's life, but Ryle was barely human anymore, unable to speak, and only doing what Charles commanded. Coming through the breach gave Hoffman an unusual ability. He had a powerful command of constructs of all kinds that he could exert with his mind. Eventually, Hoffman came to the horrible realization that his brother was no longer human at all. He was just another construct that Hoffman was subconsciously controlling with his mind. He made the decision to finally lay his brother to rest. Once Ramos was arrested, several of his safe houses began activating, spilling out constructs that seemed to have been on a timer, and they started attacking people. When they investigated, Hoffman found the results of horrible experiments the doctor was doing, using human parts grafted to horrible machines. When he was approached by some of Ramos's former associates, who asked for his help in tracking down the rest of these abominations and putting them out of their misery, Hoffman reluctantly agreed to cooperate. So next, let's talk about why you might like Hoffman and his crew. And the answer is robots. Almost all of Hoffman's crew is comprised of robots. Some of them are from the guild, who have the more kind of martial style robots that are used for peacekeeping and guarding important sites. But some of them also come out of the Miners and Steamfitters Union. You got sword and board robots, you got tiger robots, you got flying robots, you got machine gun robots. Robots for days. It's pretty cool. There's a couple of humans in Hoffman's crew, but really, I know, we're just here for the robots. For some more info about how Hoffman and the Augmented crew plan the table, let's go to Doug. The next one up is a lot of folks' favorite. He's a fan favorite. He's a dual master. So he is both Guild and Arcanist. And this is Charles Hoffman 1. So Charles Hoffman 1 is basically Malifaux's version of Iron Man. He's got like this dope iron suit. And what he focuses on from a playstyle perspective is he has a bunch of robots. And his crew is characterized by a ton of armor and some pretty punchy weapons. And he actually has a huge availability of models to his keyword. Because what we're going to talk about at the very, very end of this video, he inherited a lot of Ramos's models. So he has a very wide range of constructs available to him that he can basically take advantage of at tons of different schemes and scenario paths. So if, if there's almost no scheme or strat pool that he wouldn't have models that would be available to do different things, whether or not that's tiny little fly bat models that are really mobile, whether or not that's giant punchy guys, whether or not that's shooty guys, whether or not that's guys that throw their own models and reposition them, whether or not it's mechanical tigers, Hoffman's got it all. So Hoffman 2 is a little bit more complex in terms of play style in that he revolves around making a smaller number of movable and controllable pylons. And then you channel his primary ability, which is called alternating current, through those pylons to do irreducible Nikolai Tesla-style damage to whatever unfortunate object is in its path. Now, it's worth noting that Charles Hoffman did go through a, a nerf patch, but it wasn't too crazy. And he's still really strong, this particular one, because he was just so crazy powerful. So worth noting, but he's definitely still playable and definitely still a good master. Damien Ravencroft is an avid student of magic. 
He was so well known for his ability to decipher puzzles and locate magical artifacts that he was often sought after by the likes of Ramos and the Arcanists for help. This desire for knowledge eventually led him to do something reckless. He devised a way to lock his personality and memories inside of a puzzle box, and then allowed himself to be captured by Sonya Crit and the Witch Hunters. They put him in the Yellow Crypt, stripping away his mind and turning him into a witchling stalker that's devoid of all magic. After working as a stalker for a time, his personality slowly came back to him until he was able to unlock the puzzle box and regain everything he had locked away. He made his escape from the guild, and now he is the only person to have entered the Yellow Crypt and made it out with his mind intact, with memories of the secret magic that Sonya Crid employed. This magic is one of the guild's most closely held secrets, and now he is being hunted as one of the guild's most wanted. After going into hiding for a long time, Damien recently re-emerged and made contact with Colette, agreeing that the two should work together towards their common interests. He was then invited into the Library of All Things to try to help research how to beat the Burning Man. He used his time there to research the tyrants, and then made his way to a cave in the north, where he made contact with Witness. During Damien's time as a Witchling Stalker, he made contact with several rogue mages, many of whom can be found working with him and his crew. So why might you be interested in playing Damien? Well, Damien's a really interesting character in the lore. He's kind of all about spreading the knowledge of magic to the people. And so his crew is comprised of a bunch of rogue mages, some of which he met during his time in the guild. So you end up with this kind of group of strange, quirky personalities, and I think it can be a lot of fun. He also seems to have ran into some Soulstone Gaiman while he was off searching for Witness. And he came in touch with Loth Bot, who is a guy with a tragic backstory, and kind of acts like a Soulstone Golem. So it's not just mages, you also get these strange monsters in your crew as well. Again, let's talk to Doug about how Damien and the Witness keyword feel in the game. Now, the newest master is Damien Ravencroft. Damien Ravencroft has two versions. The first version is called Aspirant, and Damien Ravencroft functions around a thing called the Configuration, which is a, basically a separate zone that exists outside of the game, well, outside of the primary normal game state, that you pitch cards into and out of for value. Now, manipulating the configuration will give you and the models in your crew additional effects on the actions that they take, which is why it's so good to really keep track of the, the, the configuration. But it's hard to keep track of the configuration because it's a whole other separate entity that you have to track during the game state to get value out of it. So he's kind of like a big brain, big move master. His second version, Damien Ravencroft Unbound, is all about channeling refraction abilities through each other and he has a really damaging really powerful sword called absolute control that if you if you use your configuration correctly you can add massively powerful attributes to this absolute control attack and it can he can single-handedly go and just kill entire crews on like turn one or two which you know we're, we're gonna probably gonna take a look at that game state and we'll see how things look in gg4 and the next errata patch but he's a very powerful master right now Victor Ramos was key in the expansion of the Miners and Steamfitters Union, as well as the founding of the Arcanists. He encouraged other magic users to stand up for their rights against the oppressive guild, who wanted their abilities to be banned, or worse, to have them arrested or killed. Ramos' own abilities allowed him to build and animate mechanical constructs, but his real power was in his political savvy and his popularity among his followers. He soon began construction of the Leviathan, a huge mechanical construct that should allow him to take on the guild single-handedly. His efforts to manufacture artificial soul stones to power this construct turned up a failure, so soon Ramos began seeking out a legendary soul stone of unimaginable power known as the Soulstone Geode. His obsession with the Geode saw him neglecting some of his duties to the Arcanists and Union, and eventually he left them in the hands of Karis and Ironsides and went off in search of his treasure. This dereliction of duty didn't sit right with Ironsides, and when she was offered a deal by the Guild in exchange for Ramos, she took them up on the offer. Sonya Crid cornered him in the cave where he found the Geode, and when he called on his men to help, they all stood by and refused. Now, he sits in a prison cell on Earth, though he had many plots and schemes in motion, some of which weren't even known by his closest associates. So why might you be interested in playing Ramos? Well, Ramos was the original Robot Master, and he uses a particular brand of robots that he makes himself. These four-legged spider constructs are kind of his trademark, and they're cool because they can join up together to form a more powerful version of themselves called a Swarm. His totem is a spider, and he's also got the Mecharachnid, so I guess you could say Ramos has a thing for spiders. He also makes use of electrical magic, but really his big thing is that he can summon these robots, kind of building them out of scrap metal on the fly, and then using them to fight his enemies. And one more time, let's go to Doug for some more info about Ramos and his crew in-game. Ramos is a dead man's hand, so it means that you cannot play this guy in a tournament unless you have explicit permission from your TO. These have not been balanced for the actual meta of Malifaux, 
if you play one of these masters, it is very likely that they are overtuned, but they're really fun. So if you're going to play one of these masters, you really should let your opponent know and say, hey, I want to play a dead man's hand master. Or I'm planning on playing a dead man's man master. Are you okay with that? Just so you know I'm doing this. So Ramos is really good. His keyword is construct, just like Hoffman. He has access to a lot of different tools for almost any different reason. And he has a really good summoning mechanic, basically. Other than that, he's a really solid model. He's got really high willpower. He's got uh, decent triggers, but the real value here is the breadth and depth of things that he has access to as models that are tagged as constructs, because that's a lot of models in the game, uh, even more than Hoffman. And also his summoning is very good. So that's about it, guys. I'll throw it back over to you, Mr. Dice. And I hope this was informative. Thanks, guys. And that's it for every Arcanist crew. I think the Arcanists have a lot of interesting stories. And from a look and feel perspective, they're really diverse. They're not all just mages that shoot fireballs. Although you can get that too. Thanks a bunch to all the members of the community who submitted pictures for me to show off during the video. You can find some of their Instagrams linked in the description as well. And if you want to submit some pictures for future videos like this, then send them to this email address. Just make sure they're organized by keyword. And don't forget to let me know how to credit you. So I want to know, after watching this video, which master or keyword appeals to you the most? And did your opinion change from what you thought it would be when you came into the video? Drop a comment below and let me know. If you want to learn more about any of these masters, then check out the videos I have linked below, where you can get a much deeper dive into any of the masters from the Arcanists. And stay tuned because I'll be doing a video like this for all the other factions coming up. And if you want to know more about how any of these masters play, then check out this video that the Danger Planet did, and keep an eye out for their keyword tier list that they've been putting out, because those are really good videos talking about the pros and cons of all the models and the keywords. Speaking of which, huge thanks to Doug from the Danger Planet for giving all that great information about how the crews play. Make sure you check out their channel because they do a lot of good Malifaux coverage. And thanks a lot to Deck from Corner Case for telling us why he likes Rasputina so much. Definitely go check out his channel as well. He also does a lot of really cool Malifaux stuff, and he covers some other games too. If you want to support this channel, then don't forget to check out the merch store, the weird affiliate link if you're going to buy some stuff from Malifaux, and the Patreon, where you can get a whole bunch of benefits, including shoutouts at the end of the videos, just like the Steam Powered Scoundrels, Dogmatize, and Biclops Gladiator Games. Thanks a bunch to all of them, and thanks for watching.